judgment in the appeal of the President of the Methodist Conference against Preston. The judgment in this case will be given by Lord Sumption. Uh, the question which arose on this appeal was whether a minister in the Methodist Church is entitled to claim against the Church for unfair dismissal. Under the Employment Rights Act 1996, which governs this question, only an employee has the right not to be unfairly dismissed. An employee is defined in the Act as meaning someone who has entered into or works under a contract of service. Uh, Haley Ann Preston was ordained as a Methodist minister in 2003 and initially served as a probationer in the Taunton Circuit in Devon. In 2005, she accepted an invitation to become the superintendent minister in the Redruth Circuit in Cornwall and was subsequently stationed there by the Methodist Conference. In 2009, she resigned from the Redruth Circuit and began proceedings in the Employment Tribunal claiming for unfair constructive dismissal. The Employment Tribunal held that she was not an employee and dismissed her claim. But the case then went to the Employment Appeal Tribunal and from there to the Court of Appeal, both of which took a different view and ruled that she was an employee. The Supreme Court has concluded by a majority of four to one, Baroness Hale dissenting, that the Employment Tribunal was right uh, and that Miss Preston was not an employee. It therefore allows the Church's appeal. In the great majority of cases, the question, whether someone who has has, the question whether someone has entered into or works under a contract of service is easy enough to answer. If the answer is not to be found in the express language of a written contract, it will usually be apparent from the nature of the work and the terms on which it is to be performed and remunerated. Full-time stipendiary ministers of religion, however, have always presented special problems of classification. Until relatively recently, the courts took the view that they were not employees because their status as, office, as holders of an office or their religious vocation explained their performance of their duties without the need to posit a contract of service. Over the last 25 years, however, the courts, right up to the House of Lords, have modified their approach and ceased to regard these factors as determinative. The question whether Ms Haley was, a, was party to a contract at all, and if so, whether it was a contract of service, are questions uh, which depend upon the intentions which can reasonably be imputed to the parties. In the view of this court, uh, the primary considerations are the manner in which the minister was engaged and the rules governing his or her service. As with any other question of interpretation, the relevant documents have to be examined against their factual background, including the spiritual character of their work. The status of Methodist ministers is governed by the constitution of the church and the standing orders. In order to become a Methodist minister, it is necessary to be admitted to what is called full connection with the Methodist church and then to be ordained with the approval of the ministerial session of the Methodist conference. These steps bring the new minister into what the constitution and standing orders define as a lifelong relationship with the church under which they submit to a common discipline and collectively exercise pastoral responsibilities within the church. The lifelong character of the Methodist ministry is not just an aspiration, but a reality. A minister cannot cease to be in full connection with the church, except in limited and carefully defined circumstances, all of which depend ultimately on the decision of the Methodist conference. Uh, he or she has no unilateral right to resign, even on notice. The minister's duties during his or her ministry depend on the process known as stationing, which is the means by which a Methodist minister is assigned to particular duties. Ministers are stationed annually by the conference. This again is a unilateral process and not a consensual one. Before a minister is stationed to a particular circuit, it is normal for him or her to meet the stewards of the circuit and to be invited by them to be stationed there. But the standing orders make it clear that the decision whether to station the minister to that circuit is to be made by the conference on the advice of its stationing committee. And the invitation of the circuit stewards is only one factor in that decision. In the view of this court, uh, these arrangements were not contractual. Admission to full connection and ordination are not themselves contracts. Ms. Pe Preston's case was that there was a contract for her to serve as superintendent minister at Redruth, which was contained in, or at least evidenced by, the circuit's invitation and her acceptance of it. 
This view was accepted by the Employment Appeal Tribunal and the Court of Appeal, and it is accepted by Baroness Hale in her dissenting judgment on this appeal. But the majority of the court is unable to accept it. The invitation to join the Red Ruth circuit, which was extended to her by its stewards, was not a contract, nor was her acceptance of that invitation. The standing orders show that the circuit had no authority to station Ms. Preston as their minister, and that their invitation to her was only a proposal for, co for consideration by the stationing committee of the conference. Nor was the conference bound to keep her stationed there for the period specified in the invitation. They could move her to other duties at any time. In the view of the majority, Ms. Preston became superintendent minister at Redruth, not pursuant to any agreement made in 2005 with either the circuit or the conference, but pursuant to the discipline which she had accepted two years earlier when she assumed the lifelong commitment to the church upon her admission to full connection and ordination. Her duties arose from the standing orders and constitution of the church and not from any contract. Her stipend and her accommodation in a manse were, as the standing orders show, a mode of supporting her work as a minister and not contractual remuneration. The nature of the arrangement, and in particular its lifelong character, are not easily analysed in contractual terms. Baroness Hale, in a dissenting judgment, considered that a minister's enjoyment of a stipend and a manse clearly indicated an enforceable right which suggested a contractual relationship. In her view, Ms. Preston's status as a minister was not, was, was not contractual, but her assignment to a particular position in the church was a contractual arrangement, negotiated at the local level but, and then made at the national level. The fact that her assignment to the Redruth circuit was liable to be prematurely terminated did not prevent it uh, from representing a mutual contractual obligation uh, unless and until that happened. Uh, in the result, the appeal will be allowed and the order of the Employment Tribunal will be restored. The Court will now adjourn.